Benvenuti e benvenuti al webinar Lesher e Anna dal titolo An R with Jack London. Il webinar rientra nella programmazione e supporto della didattica a distanza, promosso dalle case editrici Lesher e Anna, tenendo conto delle esigenze di dati emerse a seguito dell'emergenza sanitaria che obbliga la chiusura delle scuole. Interviene Nora Nagy, insegnante di inglese come lingua straniera e ricercatrice universitaria. Tra i suoi campi di ricerca, multimodalità sem semiotica, didattica museale e lo sviluppo dell'abilità di scrittura in lingua straniera. Nora è anche coautrice del Helping Readers Blog e ha adattato per la serie Helping Readers The Age of Innocence di Edith Wharton, che abbiamo appena saputo di essere nominato finalist nel prestigioso Language Learning Literature Award. Allora, vi passo un'ora che inizierà il webinar e vi auguro buon ascolto e buona lezione a tutti. Grazie Maria. Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar today. You will spend an hour with Jack London and me today. So let's see what this webinar is going to be about. The plan for today is to introduce you first to Jack London and his novel The Call of the Wild. And then we will talk a bit about the setting of the novel and the background of the novel. And then you will meet Buck, the main character. After this, we will read some passages together and we will pay attention to read the passages for vocabulary development. Um, after reading, I will give you some writing tips, two writing exercises that you can do after the reading session, and also some tips and reading strategies to continue reading the novel. And I will also give you some ideas how you can explore the theme of the novel a bit more. So, let's see who Jack London was. <clears throat> if you look at this picture, you can see a young man wearing a leather jacket. He looks quite adventurous and brave. And he is holding a notebook. Maybe he is, um, maybe he is writing something in his notebook. So, who was Jack London? He was born in San Francisco in 1876, and he started working at the age of 10. He did all sorts of jobs, and he even lived as a tramp for a while. So what did he do in his free time? He spent a lot of time in the library reading. He even prepared himself to, to get accepted at the University of Berkeley, where he studied for a year. Unfortunately, he had to leave university because he had some money problems. And he decided to go to Alaska for an adventure. Um, after a year, he became ill and he returned home. And he became a writer. In 1903, he, he published his first successful novel called The Pool of the Wild. And this is the novel we are going to uh, talk about today. He even bought a farm in California. And he lived and wrote there until he died in 1916. You can read a bit more about his life if you read the reader, uh, the Halbring Reader edition of The Call of the Wild. So when you, when you look at and you start reading a novel, it is always a good idea to first look at the cover. And you can use the cover to predict the meaning and predict the setting and predict the whole story. When you look at the cover of The Call of the Wild here, this is the Helping Reader Edition, and this was designed for levels A2 and B1. I would like you to write two words uh, in the chat box about the cover. Any two words that come to your mind. I will wait a little to see if you... Wolf and forest, some people are saying. Childlike. Forest and animals. All right, thank you. Uh, can you guess where the story takes place? In the woods. Somebody already knows the answer. In nature. And, there's, and the main character is a wolf in the wilderness. Yes, that's nice. So these were my own answers. So I can see some pine trees. I see maybe a wolf. I guess it is in Canada or somewhere in the north, in the woods. And 
I can see a dog that behaves like a wolf, so I'm not quite sure if I don't know what the story is about, if this is a wolf or a dog, so I want to find out more about this. So where exactly does this story take place? I like checking the setting of a story on a map to explore where these places are in, in real life. So in this Google map, you can see you can see um, North America, the United States, and Canada. And if you look at the bottom of the route that I have marked on this map, you see that the story starts in Santa Clara Valley. Um, from Santa Clara Valley, we go up to North San Francisco, and we carry on further north to Seattle, to Skagway, and to Klondike. Now I would like you to identify the state where these cities can be found. So can you write in the chat box where you find Santa Clara Valley and San Francisco? Which state? Nice. Yes. Easy. Easy for everyone. It is in California. Good, thank you. All right, let's move on. And we go further up north. And we arrive in Seattle. In which state can you find Seattle? Yes, Laura says Washington. Tiziana says Washington. Yes, and it's a good idea to remember that Washington is the state on the west coast and Washington DC is the city on the east coast. From here, we follow the coastline up north and we arrive in Skagway. This small town is one of the coldest states in the United States. Which one is this state? We are near Canada, Simona, yes, but the others are right in Alaska and they are right. So we arrive in Alaska. And from here, we go even further up north, and we go up to Klondike. And Klondike is in, Laura is already writing. Klondike is in the Yukon Territory. And this area is actually in Canada, of the Yukon. That's nice. So you can see that our story takes us from the south of the United States, all the way from California up to Alaska. Next, I would like you to think about California and Alaska and write one word for California and one word for Alaska that comes to your mind. Sun and ice, sun and snow, hot and cold, warm and cold, sunny. Very nice. So it's nice to imagine what these places might be like before we start reading the story. Warm and cold, blue and white. It's nice to think about colors. Gold and ice, beautiful. So these are the words that I thought of. California is densely populated. It's quite sunny and hot. You see a lot of beaches and even deserts. There are big cities in California, long summers. And this is where you find a lot of fresh fruit. In Alaska, uh, you find fresh fish, snow and ice. The winters are long. There are small villages. It's quite wild, remote, uninhabited, and even cold. But you will find the sea or the Pacific Ocean and lakes and mountains in both areas. Now, if you remember the map from before, you will be able to identify the pictures I'm going to show you now. So, do you remember where the story begins? Can you write the name of the place? It's California, but more specifically, it's in yes, yeah, Santa Clara Valley. This is an old picture from Santa Clara. From here, we go to, this one is easy. To not to Seattle immediately, 
But first, yes, we go to San Francisco. Do you know the name of the bridge? Yes, it's the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's quite sunny and quite pretty. From here on, we go up, sorry, north, and we arrive in Seattle. You can see the skyscrapers and a big mountain in the background, and that big mountain is Mount Rainier. So you see that we are getting closer and closer to big snowy mountains. And from here on, we arrive here. What's the name of this place? It's a small town. It's an entry point to Alaska. This is Skagway. Yes. You can see the port. And finally, we get to this place. Do you remember the name of this place? Klondike. Yes. This is a picture taken from the Klondike Highway. You can see the wilderness here, a big river, and some mountains in the background. Uh, this place looks very different in the winter. And now we are going to travel not only in, in space, but also in time. We go back to this place, and you can see some people here who are crossing a big mountain and they are going to they are going on a big and dangerous adventure. Now uh, this picture was taken in 1898 and you can see some Klondikers here passing the mountain range. Um, this exactly takes us back to the time of the novel. And the next page or slide you can see a quote from the novel, which says, Some men had found a yellow metal in the Arctic darkness, and thousands of other men were rushing there. Um, what is this yellow metal? It's easy. That's gold. Yes. And they were rushing up there. So the name of the era or the period is called the Klondike Gold Rush. And the people you can see in the picture are gold prospectors. So they went up there to find their fortune, to find a lot of money, and to go back home rich. So just to recap, the time of this period, or the time of the novel, is the Klondike Gold Rush, which, which lasted for three years between 1896 and 99. And about, and about 100,000 prospectors went up there. Only a few of them found their fortune. And most of them had to return home or they didn't even survive. Uh, the Call of the Wild begins during this period and takes us up north to the Flondike Gold Rush, as it begins in the autumn of 1897. Next, we are going to look at a double page from the Herbing Reader, and we will read some passages from chapter one. The title of this chapter is Into the Primitive. When you look at a graded reader, you will always see in graded readers a lot of illustrations that you can use to check the meaning of a scene. And if you look at the text, next to the text you see a small icon. If you, if you look at that icon, that icon will always tell you that there is an audio file that you can listen to. And since it's a B1 level book, there will be a lot of words, probably, or a few words that you, you don't understand. And those, those words you can check at the bottom of the page in the glossary. On the right side, you can see this. So let's see where we are now. We are in California. We are in Santa Clara Valley. And we meet Buck, our main character. If you look at this, this dog, Buck, can you please think of two words to describe him? What is he like? Self-confident and happy. Happy and lively. He's joyful, clever. He looks clever. Maybe because of the eyes. He looks smart. 
lively and playful. So all his movements make us think that he is a cute dog, Elisa. And he looks wise, even peaceful. Nice. So these are the words that I have collected. So he looks strong, muscly, proud, friendly, happy, loyal. And he is a pet. He is not a dangerous dog at all. Yes, he is very strong. Um, it is just a good reminder that when you start reading the story and you look at an illustration, you already have some ideas about what's going to happen in the text. And you can use this, this knowledge to, to have your own reading as you are reading a novel or a creative reader. So, we will read a short paragraph to, to learn a bit more about Buck. I would like you to, to just read this text now, and then I will have a couple of questions. So, Buck lived at a big house in a sunny valley in California, which was owned by Judge Miller. And Buck ruled over it all. He was born there, and he had lived there for the four years of his life. There were many other dogs, but they lived together in the kennels or inside the house. But Buck was neither a house dog nor a kennel dog. The whole of Judge Miller's land was his. Buck was king, king over all the creeping, crawling, flying things of Judge Miller's land, humans included. So when you read a passage like this, you can focus on the plot, and you can also focus on some vocabulary to describe Buck, for example, or describe a character. Here, I, I identify that it's the sunny valley in California where we are. And if I want to describe Buck, I will use words like he was, he ruled over it all, so the land, he, he ruled over all of the big house. And he was a special dog, he was a different dog, because he was neither a house dog nor a kennel dog. But he was more like a king, a king that ruled over and he, he was a king over all the creatures and all the things in the house. You can keep a notebook of these words and then use them later in a writing exercise. So let's learn a little bit more about Buck now and see what type of dogs dog he was. So Buck's father was a type of dog or a breed of dog and Buck's mother was a different breed. Can you identify? the breed, or the, the two different types. So Buck's father is a, yes, I'm waiting for some more answers. San Bernardo, someone said, or a collie. So, here are the answers. Buck was a special dog also because he was a mixed dog. And he had qualities from good qualities from both his mother and father. As his father was a Saint Bernard and his mother was a Scotch Collie. So in this book you can read a lot about dogs and you can learn a lot about uh, dog vocabulary as well. Um, let's look at some more information about what kind of dog Buck was. Read this passage with me and then I will have a couple of questions for you. His father Elmo, a huge Saint Bernard, had been the judge's inseparable companion. And when he died, Buck took his father's place. He was not so large, he weighed only 60 kilograms. So his mother, Shep, had been a Scottish sheepdog. He had had a good life and he was proud of himself, for he had not become a house dog. Hunting and other outdoor activities had hardened his muscles and swimming had made him healthy. So you see, we get to learn a lot more about Buck here. And I have three questions for you. I wonder if you can answer them without looking at the text. So what was Buck's father's name? How heavy was Buck? And why was he proud of himself? Sixty kilos and Elmo, Elmo, Elmo. Nice. Do you remember why he, he was so proud of himself? He was strong. He took his father's place. 
He was really healthy. And somewhere in that, yeah, he said he wasn't a house dog. Yes. So yeah, I highlighted the answers here for you. His father's name was Amo. Buck wasn't too large. He was 60 kilos. And as somebody said, as a lot of you are saying, he was really proud of himself because he had not become a house dog. Yes, he spent a lot of time outdoors, which make, made him really strong and healthy. Let me point out just one more word here. Also, his father was the judge's inseparable companion. So it indicates that not only Bob, but also his father was a really loyal and a nice dog. All right. From here on, so at this stage of the chapter, we find Buck in California living in the judge's house. But something, something bad happens to him. He is stolen by some bad people and he is taken to San Francisco. And from San Francisco, he's, he travels on a train all the way up to Seattle. So in the next scene, we go from San Francisco to Seattle and we find Buck on a train. If you look at this passage from the, from the reader, you will see a very different type, a very different type of dog. When you look at the picture and you see you see Buck in a cage, how do you think he feels now? Can you can you describe him with one word? Enraged, angry, scared, furious, trapped, that's good, frustrated. Yes. He's full of rage. Yes, mad. He's really angry. Yes, all of these things are correct. In the next slide, we will read this passage you, you saw next to the picture. And I would like you to concentrate on the different feelings Buck has in this passage. Buck was dazed with horrible pains in his throat and on his tongue. He was thrown down and choked repeatedly until they managed to cut the breast collar of his neck. Then the rope was removed and he was pushed into a cage. He lay there for the rest of the night feeling angry. He could not understand that it, what it all meant. What did these strange men want with him? Why were they keeping him in this small box? He felt worried that something bad was going to happen to him soon. He jumped up several times in the night expecting to see the judge or his sons come in, but each time it was only the barman checking on him. So what are the three feelings or adjectives in this passage that, that are used to describe Buck. He's confused and scared, angry. All right, let's have a look. He looks angry and worried, upset, puzzled, angry, suffering. Mm -hmm. So the three words are dazed, angry and worried. Angry and worried are easier words to understand, but these might be a more difficult word. So you will see a glossary at the bottom of the page. You can use either, the, either these glosses or you can use the context and the, and the text that follows an adjective to understand what these words actually mean. So let's see how these words are described. You can concentrate on what made him feel dazed, what made him feel angry, and what he was worried about. So he was dazed, which means that he was confused and unable to think, because there he felt horrible pains in his throat and on his tongue. He was thrown down and choked repeatedly. So he was hurt and he couldn't think anymore because of all these bad things that happened to him. He also felt angry because he couldn't understand what it all meant. And he was worried about his future. You can imagine that he's worried that something even worse might happen to him. 
So let's check the meanings of these words again. What does days mean? A or B? A, 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 yes. So you remember that days means confused and unable to think. Yes, that's a very new situation. At the beginning of the story, he had a very different life. Let's see the next word. What made him angry? Do you remember? Yes. He was angry because he. everyone is saying D. Very good. Because he was hurt and confused. And finally, do you remember what he was worried about? Yes. Yeah. Easy, very good. He thought that something bad might happen to him. All right. So from here on, we leave we leave Seattle from the from the train. He arrives in Seattle, and he is sold. And he saw to some, some new man, some good man actually, who, who are not going to hurt him that much. And he finds himself on a ship on the way to Alaska. And this next passage, we will learn a bit more about how box feelings change. And we will also learn how you can describe things and describe, use vocabulary, new vocabulary to describe something ordinary. I would like you to, to read this passage and guess the last missing word in this paragraph. At the first step upon the court surface, Buck's feet sank into something that was white and soft like mud. He jumped back with a bark. More of this white stuff was falling through the air. He shook himself, but more of it fell upon him. He sniffed it curiously. Then licked them up with his tongue. It was like fire, and the next instant it was gone. This puzzled him. He tried it again with the same result. The people watching him laughed loudly, and he felt ashamed, so he didn't know why, for it was his first easy yes. No. It was his first no. Everybody is getting it right. Okay, so yes, the missing word is snow here. And there are a lot of phrases which indicate that the phenomenon or the object or the thing described here is snow. First of all, he stepped upon a court surface, which was, and it was white, and it, it was something that was soft like mud. When you don't know how to describe something to use, the, you use the word stuff. So, you can say here it was some kind of white stuff that was falling through the air. So first it was like fire. You can compare it to something else. It was like fire. And then it was gone. It disappeared. So from, from Buck's perspective, this unknown thing can be described with such expressions. And he can describe it or he describes it to something that he already knows. Now let's see how he felt in this situation. First, he was curious. He sniffed it curiously. He was puzzled. So this thing puzzled him. And he also felt ashamed. But, but he wasn't ashamed because he did something wrong. He just didn't understand why all the people were laughing around him. So you can use these different passages to understand how box feelings changed all through the novel. Do you remember how he felt at the beginning of the story? And then at the, at the, at the middle of the chapter and the, at the end of the chapter. So write three words to describe the three different stages of his feelings. First he was proud. And then Cheerful, angry, and surprised. That's nice. Happy, angry, and then ashamed. He was proud, angry, and puzzled. 
proud, angry, and curious. So all through the chapter, you can pay attention to how Bach's personality and how his feelings change, and you can carry on doing this all through the novel. Yes. Happy, furious, and then confused. Poor Bach, all these things happen to him in only one chapter. All right, so this is where the first chapter leaves us, and you can carry on reading the, the rest of the book to, to find out what happens to Bach after, after his trip on the ship, to the journey on the ship to, to Alaska. So when you have finished reading um, a chapter, you can always check back to see the pictures again and to remember the main themes from this chapter. For example, here you can see Buck on the ship, you can see a man in the background. And you see that this man is smiling, so that indicates that he is not a cruel man and he, he, he let's hope he is not going to hurt Buck anymore. And you can see Buck in the in the foreground sniffing the snow, trying to find out what it is. Alright. So I said that we would also look at some writing exercises that you can complete on your own after this lesson. And one of this is a creative writing task. So what you can do is you can try to describe something from a new perspective, just like Bach experienced snow from, from his own perspective and he tried to understand what it was uh, based on his, his previous experiences. You can also imagine that you are a bird and you finally leave your cage and you experience flying in the wind for the first time. So what you can do is, is use expressions use expressions like this one, this list here from, from the, the last passage. So for example, you can say more of this white stuff, something that was white and soft like mud. It was like fire. You, he, you can also use the senses and describe what kind of sensation something gives to you. So you can describe what it smells like, what it tastes like. He sniffed it furiously. He licked up some with his tongue. And then you can also describe how he feel in this situation. You can try and write in the chat box a very short description to, in which you describe what the, this bird feels like in the wind. You can either write a full sentence or you can just... No, you can I don't think that a bird can lick. But you can use a similar expression. So. A bird can fly. Some birds probably can smell. All right, let's see some other feelings. So Laura is saying, clear thing, transparent, impalpable, like a blow, smell, taste, it dazzled him, he felt amazed. <laughs> it's quite poetic. Elizabeth is saying he can sniff the air and the flavor of liberty. Annalise is saying that the bird now feels lighter. Danielle is saying that he felt galvanized by the wind. Yes, Julia, you are right. The bird can hardly fly, probably. But he will have to learn to fly again. Gina is saying he felt light, like a feather floating in the warm air of spring. The bird might feel overwhelmed. Suddenly too much liberty. He thinks he is an angel now. So let's see some more ideas. What do you think wind can feel like? 
floating high and low, like a feather carried by the wind. All of you come up with such nice ideas, you could write a poem about it. He was floating high and low, like a feather carried by the wind. He felt light, free, but scared. So this makes me think of another poem. You can find it on Google if you type in the cage bird and read read about it. Read about how, what a cage bird might feel like. So this is my reading tip for you. Apart from writing a passage about uh, the bird, you can also read a poem. So let's see another writing idea. Um, when you are, when you have finished reading a chapter, you can also use the expressions that you have learned or read about, the new expressions or even the expressions that you have already known from the chapter to rewrite a story uh, or re write a summary of, of that chapter. This is a good idea for your reading journal. So instead of only remembering the plot, try to collect all the difficult words or all the new words to write your own uh, summary. So using these words or using any other word that you can remember from the previous paragraph, uh, can you please write a short summary of this first chapter? So remember to use words like sunny valley, king ruled over, strong, angry, pain, choke, worried, snow and puzzled. But you might remember words like days or puzzled or curious. So I will give you some time and you can write your little summaries in this rewriting exercise. So. Nice, the first answer has arrived. A big dog bark was stolen from his home in Sunny Valley, where he was the king of his home, and he was strong and ruled over all creatures. He felt angry with pain because where, where am I? Because they stole him, they choked him, and he was worried about what could happen to him. When he arrived, he experienced snow for the first time, and he was puzzled. Very nice, Laura. Elizabeth is saying, at first he lived in a sunny valley, and he was the king of the house, also ruling over humans. He was strong. Happy and strong dog lived in a sunny valley until he was taken by a group of men. Now he lives in a cage full of pain and worried. Very nice. I will wait for a couple more answers to see, because some other people are typing, I see. A happy and strong dog lived in a sunny valley until he was taken by a group of men. Pain and worried. Then he was angry and felt pain because he was repeatedly choked. But fortunately, then something good happened to him as well. Captivity made him angry and worried, but later the snow made him feel puzzled, so that he was worried about his destiny. So that he was worried about his destiny, yes, yeah. <laughs> that is the best role. Yes, so I think it's a good reminder that even if you you cannot check the meaning of the new words in a chapter as you are reading or you even if you don't want to to memorize them which you shouldn't just memorize words or you don't want to 
to keep checking the dictionary for new words. The chapters are quite long, so it's a very good idea to keep a notebook, write up the new words, and when you have finished the chapter, use this in a creative, productive exercise in which you have to use these, these words in your own way in a new context. So this is my writing tip to, to memorize, to, memor to, to learn new vocabulary. Because it's one thing when we understand a new word, and it's another thing if we can actually use that word in, 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 in creating new text. And that should be the purpose of learning new vocabulary. So this was the text that I wrote. I think that you wrote actually much nicer and interesting text. So I wrote, Buck, Buck was a bad dog living in a sunny valley in California. He lived like a king and ruled over the whole house. He was a strong and happy dog. One day he was stolen by some bad man who caused him a lot of pain. They hurt and choked him. Buck changed. He became an angry dog and he was worried about his future. Later, some good things also happened to him. When some people took him on a ship to Alaska, he experienced his first snow. This puzzled him and he made the people laugh. Very nice texts are still coming in. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Okay, so how can you continue reading? We have finished reading the first chapter together. We focused on some new vocabulary. As I mentioned before, you can use, uh, you can read the, the rest of the book and focus on how Bob further changes because he doesn't only change in space. He doesn't only go from south to north. He is also going on a personal journey and you can pay attention to the different stages of his feelings and how his personality develops. So that's my first tip. Then as you keep reading, you can always focus on guessing meaning from context. If you can't find the new words at the bottom of the page, you can focus on is, uh, the description of a word. Because when you read a difficult word, there will be some clue before or after that will help you understand. Uh, what that new word might mean. Another uh, good reading strategy is to keep looking back, to remember what happened before, to observe what's happening in the moment, and always use your knowledge to predict what might happen. It's a nice guessing game. Uh, apart from using uh, the context to guess the meaning of new words, another good way to understand what's going on in a scene or in a chapter is to use the illustrations to check the meaning. In these readers, the illustrations will always help you understand because they, they follow the story and they give you an idea uh, about the whole atmosphere and they will also illustrate new vocabulary and give you more details to pay attention to. And finally, as we did in the previous exercise, Always try to use new vocabulary to retell the story or keep a reading journal with these new words. Even if you learn only two or three new words in a chapter, it's, it is worth it. So these are my five tips to continue reading. And as you can see, this is the contents page from the, from the helping reader. There are one, two, three, four, five, six more uh, chapters to do. Uh, when you have finished reading the book, you will find some after reading activities which will help you practice grammar and vocabulary. And there will be some life skills so to read so you can explore the theme of the book even further. Um, if this is not enough for you, you can always go on the Helpling learning platform called eZone, where you can find not only the listening, the audio recording of the book, but you will find some more activities to, to practice new vocabulary and new language structures. Uh, the good thing about um, eZone is that 
it will always uh, give you uh, guidance and support and you can do it on your own because the, the exercises are self-correcting. So it's a good tip for, for future practice. And finally, how can you explore more? Here are some research topics which will take you to the wilderness, which will take you to, to the north. So first of all, you can read more about the Arctic. And even you can read more of uh, Jack London's stories because quite a lot of his stories take place in the north. And then you can read more about and you can read more about the Klondike Gold Rush. It's a really interesting uh, period of American history. And it's, I think it's very interesting that Jack London himself went um, north to find some gold. But instead of be, becoming rich because he found gold, he, he became rich and he became well known because he started writing stories. So it was worth, worth it going up north. You can also find out more about dog breeds, and this story will help you because there are a lot of there are a lot of different dogs in this story, with, and they have all different characters, and and they change differently. So I think it's a good idea to find more out more about dogs, and you can be like Jack London, and you can join a library. You remember that we mentioned that that he he was a poor boy but he he managed to get into university and it was a big thing back in the 19th century to get into Berkeley as well so what he did he joined the library and this is something you can also do uh, you can join a library and start reading and when you when you have read enough or when you have had enough inspiration you can start writing your own story so these are my these are my tips for you and if you would like to read more uh, ideas about different books, you can find uh, reading projects on the Hellsbring Readers blog, um, which you can find at helping.com readers blog. Um, if, you, if you don't want to spend um, too much time on the internet, you can also check the fact files uh, at the beginning of the book. Where, which will introduce you to different themes uh, connected to the book. So these are my ideas, and you can see that here, this is a picture from, from the cover. And I hope that, and hope that you, will, you will finish reading the book, and you will have fun reading it. When you have read the book, you can also check out the new film adaptation of the book. I think um, it is a fun experience. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. This was our, our lesson for today. If you have some questions, you can type them now um, in the chat box. And, um, and uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Nora, for that really interesting lesson. It was very, very enjoyable, and I hope you all got lots of of good tips. Um, I'd just like to remind you that the slides will be available in two days' time on Lusher's portal, which is www.formazionelusher.it or .it, I'm reading a mixture of English and Italian, slash my webinars. And you'll also be able to get a link to the recordings which you can share with your students. And we'd be interested in any feedback that um, that you have from using it. So you can send any feedback to support at hellgreen.com, which would be really good to have. The, um, anyone who is interested in Hellgreen readers and reading can also go to the readers blog the Helbling Readers blog, you can you can Google that. I put it into the, the chat box and there are lots of lesson plans, ideas 
and also tips on how to use uh, readers for distance learning uh, in this particular period. Okay, thank you very much and have a great day. And Nora will be back with another lesson. I can't remember the date. Can you remember, Nora? It's next Wednesday. Um, next Wednesday, we'll yes. be back online. And hopefully see you there with Sherlock Holmes this time, I think. Isn't that right? We're, yes. we're doing, we, we, we will we're have going a from a Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.